Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 103. This episode is actually about why I left Los Angeles and I moved to a city with no visual effects industry. I literally knew nobody in this city and I spent all of my savings and did everything that I could personally do to put myself out of my comfort zone so I could force myself to have the pressure to raise the bar, get back in the game and really have the most massive growth that I can by starting from scratch and building everything up from the ground up. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode. So this is gonna be a bit different to all the interviews I've been doing lately. I'm gonna be doing a solo episode and it's been a while since I've done one and it's just because we've had so many awesome guests coming on one after another and it's just been such a huge backlog. I think we're we're backlogged till June next year with episodes, but I still want to start to put some more personal ones in and to really make these more lessons and boot camps for us to have that growth. So as much as I'm grateful that we do have so many great interviews coming up with so many amazing people, I am going to start trying to put together one or two solo episodes every month moving forward and start to kind of really get back in the habit. Because again, I feel like looking at which ones I get the most feedback on, which ones get rated the highest, it always seems to be the solo episodes. And of course, they're the ones that require so much more work to do, but it's worth it. It's so much more worth it to see the results that you're getting. So this one's a bit long and only because I really kind of want it to resonate what I'm going over. And I hope it does. At the same time, um, this week I decided to do a 72 hour fast. And the reason I was doing that, it's not actually the first time I, I did it last week. I did a 48 hour fast and I was just really blown away by the results and it wasn't to do with weight loss or anything like that. It was, it was more to do with reading a lot about the, the health benefits of it in terms of like beating inflammation, building white blood cells, stem cells, and really resetting your body and also having this mental clarity. It was just something that I wanted to try out. And um, yeah, I, I did it last week and it was just really amazing. It was really easy to do last week as well. And I wanted to do it again this week, which I know back to back is not the smartest thing in the world, but uh, I was really excited just to kind of get back to that clarity that I was having, just something that is hard to describe, but was just like a bit of a a mindset that I wanted to um, try and explore a little bit this week. Um, This week, however, has been a bit more difficult than last week. At least the first 48 hours were. I'm on uh, the third day now and it's, you know, it's actually been really easy. I think it's just more of a mental thing that you need to beat. But um, yeah, that being said though, uh, hopefully I can stay on point with this episode. It's, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle in certain aspects and, and especially doing a podcast episode on something like this is definitely a bit tricky to do when you haven't eaten in three days. But um, yeah, I'm really enjoying doing this though. So I wouldn't recommend it, but if you do want to read up about it, there's actually um, a lot of information on prolonged fasting. And yeah, I was just, like I said, something I was doing for fun, but I obviously uh, prepared for it, both with making sure you don't have any mineral deficiency, potassium, sodium, vitamins, any any areas that you're going to deplete yourself in, and also knowing how to break that fast and, and slowly kind of wean back onto a normal routine. But uh, yeah, um, I'm, basically this episode is going to be a bit different in terms of the fact that I want to talk about why I moved to Portland, Oregon. And I, I haven't really mentioned it up until now. I've mentioned it lightly here and there, but not really as an official announcement. And even at the moment, I get every week people um, texting like, hey, I'm in LA, let's catch up. And I, you know, I have to tell them like, oh man, I, I moved. And you know, I'll, I'll give the the really basic breakdown right here as to why. And it was because I felt that I had a lot of success the past couple of years in excess in a lot of areas. And I felt like I was getting a little too comfortable. And 
I felt because of that I wasn't getting, I didn't have that hunger to hustle and succeed as much as I was in the past. And I had the crazy, crazy idea that what if I took away all the things that I take for granted and I start from scratch, what would that be like? And that is such an easy thing to say, but a very hard thing to do. And literally a week after I decided that, I went and bought a massive 4,000 square feet, six bedroom house, uh, brand new in a, in a different city that I'd never really been to and began to start this process of burning everything to the ground, starting it all over again. And I'm kind of now, as I mentioned before, about my 90 day year, like ending the year. This is where I'm finally putting everything to action that I plan to do moving here. So it's been such a, a different year for me in a lot of ways, but at the same time, um, it's it's really been great. And all of the things I talk about are what we've covered in the podcast, all the things that we do, like what I, I say to do, I'm just doing it at a much larger scale. And I've had so many great opportunities come up because of these changes. And I'm, I'm more excited about next year. Uh, I really feel like everything is coming together. Um, that being said, as this episode comes out, um, a few weeks from now, I'm going to be launching a new website or I should say a new version of my current website. And that's been something that's been three years in the making and multiple failures. And I, I don't really understand why um, other than just approaching it very differently, approaching it wrongly or wrong-ish. Um, and for me, this is, I'm really excited about just because I felt for the longest time there's so much I've wanted to do and I, I needed that new website. I hated my website so much. I described it to someone recently who was saying like, why, why is this such a big deal for you doing this website? And I described how uh, like two years ago, I had my garage broken into, like my storage unit broken into in my apartment in LA. And I knew that it was broken into, but I just refused to go down there because I didn't want to deal with it. It was, you know, there, there is some psychological things that happen when you have your place broken into and I've had that before and I think with my storage unit it kind of like brought that back up in a bit of a way and um yeah I just didn't want to deal with it so I kind of just like let it go and ignored it for the longest time and I felt like that was my website in a lot of ways so even though I would post podcast episodes up that was probably the only thing I'd really ever post on there and right now Myself and my entire team has been working really hard on a lot of really great new stuff. And I'm going to be constantly posting free training, free content, uh, a lot of guides, like actual ebooks, things like that, that you'll be able to get access to. Um, My goal is just to make it the biggest resource out there specifically for us as creatives to really make change, really to level out our career, learn new skills. Uh, to do a lot and I'm, I'm so excited about this. It's been so much work, but uh, yeah, I've, I've just been sent some of the new updates and I'm really excited about this. And there's been a lot of different areas inside of that 90 day plan that I mentioned that uh, already I'm just aggressively being able to check off and getting a lot of success there. And I've, I've been getting a lot of emails from a lot of you with your 90 day plan. So I think it's awesome. In fact, I'm going to probably do some write ups on that stuff pretty soon just because Uh, It's just so cool to kind of see people have that movement of change and success and to really knuckle down and make those commitments. And I want to work with you on those. So um, if you email me what your 90 day plan looks like, I am happy to check in with you once a week and to say, hey, how's it all going? You said you're going to do this last week. Where are you at? And see how you progress through um, these 90 days. Just because, again, I kind of put it out there just to see what would happen. and, And there's definitely people willing to put in the work. So I want more of you to do it. And um, I might even put together some lessons around that myself, including templates on how I organize mine. Here's a hint. I started using OneNote. I know I love and talk about Evernote a lot. Uh, OneNote allowed me to map out like just the way that it's going to organize. And this is the free version. Uh, I was going to buy the commercial version and I tried the trial and it it has a different interface and I don't like it. But the free version, uh, the way it's set up would allow me to have like all of my weeks. I think we're in like week 42 right now because you can check, like you can Google uh, what week of the year is it and it'll come up like week one, week 52, right? There's 52 weeks in a year. So you'll be able to see where you're at and you'll be able to map it out. So week 42, I can then put in uh, pages on that, which would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then from there have check boxes for all the things I want to accomplish. But then more importantly, at the top of that, I have a page specifically to say, these are the goals for the week. And that way I've got that bird's eye view of these are the only things that are important. It's not like walk the dog or take out the trash. It's this week, 
the the website needs to be designed this week i need to have the shoot done and all of the uh footage being tracked you know all the the key things that you need to get done so that way you're set up for the next week and you're having these bigger goals that are broken down so i've loved that just because it's it's such a simple thing that i've done but it's just allowed me to consistently get results and in fact this is going to sound really woo woo but i wrote something down as i was coming up with this that uh, I just really liked, which was just keywords to associate with the rest of the year with me hitting my goals and aggression, obsession, and urgency were, I guess, like the three that I put there. And the key word really is urgency. I think by having, um, well, what I had, I put it, it was something like, um, scheduling with urgency and, and at least to me, and it doesn't matter whether this resonates with anyone else or not, cause it's specifically for me that when I when I hear tackling your goals with urgency, instantly it means that this needs to be done. The deadline is tomorrow. And it's just a bit of a mindset shift for me. And like I said, it mightn't be for you, but for me, it means that I can tackle this goal with urgency. It means that this needs to get done because I've been feeling like for a while I'm making a bit of progress here and here and here and here, but I'm not crossing it off the list. And now it's about crushing this goal. So I think that's just been a big one for me is to attack my goals with urgency. So like I said, this episode might be a bit different than others, but at the same time, I'm hoping it's one that even though it is a bit different, will resonate for you, or at least for a majority of you. And I've got a lot of great stuff coming up. Um, I think two or three weeks from now, I'm going to be putting out a brand new video training series, one that I've been listening to a lot of people asking for. And it's also something that I'm pretty sure no one has done in terms of, again, I'm trying to really raise the bar in terms of the level of quality, the expectations of what is being delivered and really give something great. And that's something that I'm going to be putting out a new free training series on in the coming weeks. And I'm excited because it's not blowing something up because again, I I always try and put out training that's specifically with an end result. and, And that is that there is a huge demand for destruction. So a lot of the training I've been doing the last year has been a lot of dynamics, explosions, fire, pyro, all the things that are what people are looking for right now to hire. You know, all the jobs out there are, we need someone in fume or thinking particles or uh, pyro effects or Maya fluids, whatever it might be, because we need a lot of destruction done, a lot of things like that. Thanks to Marvel and its whole universe and now DCs, there is never a shortage of things needing to be destroyed. But I'm excited that I'm actually going to do some character related effects and it's going to be really cool. Uh, I'm actually shooting uh, some stuff tomorrow night. It's a week behind schedule. Urgency, you know, is, is hard when I'm having to work around the talent's schedule instead of mine and they don't have that urgency as much. But um, yeah, th- this has been really cool. So I'm excited that that training will be coming out soon. Um, as I mentioned, new websites going to be coming out soon. Uh, we're going to be putting out a couple of new guides, mini courses, so much stuff. I'm excited. And um, do me one favor, though, if you can, go to the show notes, alanmckay.com slash 103. So just the numbers 103. If I can ask one thing of you, it would mean so much to me. It's so important. And it takes a few seconds to do, and that is to share this episode and then just quickly leave a review. It can be two words, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever uh, on iTunes. But if you can do those two things, just share it on your social media and leave a review on iTunes. Again, you can just click uh, the links. They'll be on the show notes page. It's so important to me, and I'd really love for these episodes to reach as many people and hopefully benefit as many people as possible. So I'll leave it there. Check out the show notes, alanmckay.com slash 103. And I'm going to be back next week with Pixar's Victor Navone, who, if you've been in the industry for a while, you might remember the Alien song from like back in, uh, man, 2001, I think, uh, which is really cool. And he's one of the senior character animators at Pixar or Animation Soups, I should say. He'll kill me for saying that. Um, Yeah, so... That's going to be a really cool episode. And then episode after that is going to be Ruben Meyer, who is a senior effects technical director at Weta. And then I got some really cool ones coming up. Lots of really cool ones. So uh, yeah, anyway, this is the first solo episode in a while. Let's dive in. So one thing I want to talk about is habits. And that's something that I have talked about a lot in the past is forming good habits, building new routines. At the same time, there's also negative habits, and that's usually what we already have instilled in ourselves. So as much as there can be positive habits, there can also be negatives. 
And that usually is what we're dealing with day to day. And I think the key to making change is to always start out small and build a simple change, but continue to build on that change and kind of layer up those building blocks until you get that bigger result. So it's easy to go from eating lots of crap, drinking three or four times a week and sitting on the couch every single night to saying, hey, I want to run a marathon and I want to change my entire life and my career, everything all in one go. And the big problem with that is that it becomes very hard to achieve. First of all, you probably go into shock trying to do it all at once. But more importantly, what ends up happening is you're going to get overwhelmed very easily and then it's a lot easier to give up. But instilling that little tiny tweak, that little tiny change in the beginning becomes the catalyst that changes everything. So simply setting a goal of if I want to write a book, getting off of the couch, (laughs) such a simple little tweak, but one that would allow me to be able to get off my couch and go sit at my desk for two hours a day because that isn't irrational. It isn't illogical. Like that isn't much to ask. It isn't, oh my God, I got to write a book. Where do I begin? Overwhelm, overwhelm, overwhelm. It's simply, I need to get off the couch and I need to go to the desk. If I can do that, then I've achieved the goal that I set out. Of course, from there, building on that to two pages a day. doesn't matter what I write. It can be out of crap, but as long as I write two pages a day, then I'll feel like I've achieved something. I feel like I've set out and crushed my goal that I've given myself. Bit by bit, you start to get that momentum. Then things become easy. Things become fun. Same way at the gym. If you want to go and run five miles a day, going to the gym, setting the goal of just, I need to show up. You know, I don't need to work out. I just need to show up at the gym. That is enough of a tweak where you have that accountability. There's no way you can tell yourself, well, I can't make it to the gym. You know, uh, instead it becomes, I just need to show up. And of course, from there, you're going to work out. And rather than setting that five mile goal, it's just going to be building on those blocks. I think it's very easy for us to complicate our goals and to say like, oh man, you know, go in the gym. That means I got to like get out of bed. I got to go put on socks. I got to go put on shoes. I got to find my gym bag, find a fresh towel, you know, all the man, that's just so much work. I'm just going to stay in bed. That sounds a lot easier. So given the goal, the simple thing of look, I just got to show up. That's all I got to do. That's an easy one for me. So for me, for a lot of my goals, if I want to start getting up at 5 a.m. every day, the simplest tweaks I could do was I just got to get out of bed. I can roll out onto the floor. You know, as soon as I'm out of the bed, as soon as I'm out of that cozy, warm place, my day is going to start to roll into action. So starting at six in the morning, I could uh, roll out on the bed, you know, onto the floor and from there start to stretch. And then bit by bit, I'm just going to start going through those those functions. Um, Accountability has always been a big one for me where um, for me to get up at 5 a.m. would be the next step. And for me, what I started doing was organizing gym sessions in the morning. So 7 a.m., I would have a workout routine for three days a week. And then I would have live webinars with students in my mentorship and my live action series two days a week as well. And what that meant is that every single morning by 7 a.m., I need to have done everything I had set out to do prior to that thing, to be ready to go into the webinar or to go into the training session, whatever it is. Having people having expectations of you makes it a lot easier to get things done, which is why it's hard to work for yourself or run a business when you don't have that boss, that accountability. And as soon as you have a boss, you you tend to have no problem getting up and going to work and doing all those things. And that's just where we need to figure out what are our triggers? What are the things that are going to force us to take action? So one of the big things that I've experienced in the more recent years is being very ambitious, which has always been a little bit of a curse for me of really kind of setting the bar extremely high, but it's also been the thing that drives me. But the problem lies in the fact that usually I would set very black and white goals that are very high. And because I'm not measuring all the steps it takes to get there, it's either a win or fail. If I get close, it's a fail. If I meet that goal, then it's a win. And when I have a lot of goals going on, it begins to become very hard to track what's going on. And I've I've experienced that a lot more recently where I started setting very extreme goals And until I hit them every single day, I felt like I was failing. Instead of having those mini goals that I mentioned of 
write one page or write two pages or get off the couch or whatever it might be. Instead, it was run the marathon. So every day when I hadn't accomplished that marathon yet, I felt like I was in limbo. I couldn't tell if I was getting closer to my goals, if I was getting further away, what's going on. And if someone said, what are you up to today? It would be, I don't know, I've got to check my schedule or what have you accomplished this week? And I would feel like saying, I feel like I've accomplished nothing. And I felt like I was in that limbo for the longest time because I wasn't able to measure my success with those smaller goals. I've talked about this before, but being you know, a 14 year old kid in Australia wanting to go work in LA, work on big Hollywood movies. If I were to discredit everything I had done between 14 till 20, I would feel like I'm not getting there. I wouldn't feel like I'm making that progress. And therefore I would have probably given up along the way. But having those wins, measuring each step allowed me to see I'm getting closer and closer and closer to that goal. And I think somewhere along the way, I set these big, new, unique goals without having those smaller steps to measure along the way. And it definitely has made me feel like I've derailed and been a bit of a failure in certain aspects. And this is something that really gave me that urgency to start changing things a little bit in my life or more change things drastically. So I think one of the biggest things that I've changed mindset wise with my goals is these words attack with urgency. By putting that with every goal that I do, it becomes a life or death. It needs to be done today. These need to be done this week, this month, this quarter, and measuring out all of my timeline based on those small factors and big factors together. Everything with urgency means that something needs to change because I need to continue to be consistent all the way through. Now, I see a lot of people who have so much potential out there who are instead staying in their comfort zone, who aren't tackling their goals. And because they're not attacking their goals with urgency, they kind of stay stagnant. They stay stale inside of their comfort zone, holding onto their blankie or their security blanket. And they need to have that fire under their butts, the fire of change. And that's what I started to experience um, last year was feeling that stagnant, that staleness. Um, I've started having a, a lot of success in certain areas. Things definitely ballooned up a lot. And I was having a lot of success financially uh, career wise in a lot of different aspects, things have been growing exponentially the last couple of years. And it's been amazing to even just have that mindset shift of what is possible. But at the same time, it's also been counterintuitive to, to me because of some of the things that I rely on to drive me. And that is the staying hungry and the pressure and the stress that usually I kind of bank on to, to push me and to really set higher goals. So I sent out an email a couple of weeks ago to my inner circle, and this was about something that I've never talked about publicly. I might have mentioned it here and there, but I've never opened up about it. And if you want to get on my inner circle, it's my free private mailing list where I give out tutorials, videos, a lot of really valuable content for free. You just need to go to alanmckay.com slash inside, and you'll be able to access it there and sign up. And one of the things I, I talked about for the first time was really in depth, uh, my experience of being homeless when I was 17. And to me, it's something that I don't want to talk about. It's not a comfortable subject to me, but at the same time, it was again, one of those catalysts that changed my life for the better through a bad situation. So just to backpedal for a second, one of the things that I always found like a lot of people when they were teenagers always had was when they left home when they were 16, 17, the same thing that would always come up is that if it doesn't work out, they can always go home. And I always kind of resented everyone a little bit for the fact that they had that stable home and then a stable life. Their parents had a house and they had a safety net. If things went bad, they can always go home. And from the age of 14, I'd been paying the rent, paying half the rent, paying bills, doing all the adult things with my mom and I while I was still a kid. I always had those responsibilities when I was 16 or around then I moved out. I moved across country and um, started working and living on my own. And for me, it was always that I was already in the real world. I had gone through the phase where it shifted to being an adult at 14. And if things didn't work out, if I couldn't make rent, it wouldn't be I could go home. It would mean that I'd be homeless or I wouldn't be able to pay and cover my responsibilities. If I had one too many beers at the bar, I wouldn't be able to eat till the next paycheck. Now, in that email that I sent out, 
I did describe my whole experience with the only time I've ever been fired. And I lost my job. I lost the place I was living at. I went through a lot in 24 hours. Everything changed. And the reason I bring that up now is because after that experience of not having a place to live, not having any money, all the key foundations that we all value, our four pillars, which is money, relationships, security, as in a home, and of course, having a job. That stability, all those things, those are the core things that we need to survive. And by having all of them taken out in one foul swoop, it changed everything for me where something like that will shock your system. And for me, it meant that every job, everywhere I went for the rest of my life, I would always make sure that I've got that covered. I'd always have a backup plans. I would always have my job secure and make sure that everything's going well, make sure that there isn't going to be some surprise pop-up scenario down the line for me is very critical to stay on top of all of that and it meant that i would never ever allow myself to be in a situation where i wasn't in control and i wasn't safe so when i say in control not like a control freak but as in being safe making sure that i'm in control of myself and my surroundings and as things escalate and my career went on i would always have the hunger of making sure that As I grow, I'm safe in that growth and it isn't going to backfire. Because again, something that I talk about a lot is getting out of your comfort zone, uh, going where the work is, moving in certain situations, doing all these other things though. The critical thing is that if you don't do it smart, intelligently calculate everything that you're doing, it can be very easy to say, okay, great, I'm going to go and do that without planning ahead. The problem is that you're removing the foundation that you rely on. And that's the critical thing here is the fact that if you don't think about these things because again, I've, I've talked about this too, where I know uh, a lot of people who have been like, okay, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to be successful. It's going to be great. And they get here without a plan, a place to stay or any of these things. And it's a fucking disaster. And I've witnessed it and it's not pretty. Whereas other people have put aside the money they need, planned where they're going to stay, having the contingencies of knowing like, when things are bad before they get bad. So in other words, having safety measures in place. So, hey, I've got $2,000 that's going to get me by for this amount of time. If I hit $500 and I don't have these results yet, and 2000 5000 whatever it might be, if I don't have these results yet, then it's time to rethink the plan or go into plan B. So having those safety measures in place means that you know when the foundation is going to get taken up from under your feet. And I think, again, all of these things are really critical when you're making change to have all of these things covered rather than just flipping a switch and going for it. And that's why I think a lot of us are afraid to change careers midway through our lives because, again, it's such a huge risk. And it's, it's not necessarily a risk if you plan ahead, if you instill those things. And again, something I talk about in the inner circle is exactly that. I, I sent out three emails. It was the equivalent of a book. Um, I forget the word count, but it was the equivalent of a book. Uh, I spent a week... Um, just focusing on the subject because it comes up so often, and that is how to change careers. So having all the the right things in place, it means you can safely change careers without ever having any massive risk at stake. So I wanted to talk about that because I think it's really critical for everything moving forward that we have those goals in place. We have small goals, larger goals, but more the bigger plan, but also knowing if we are to take risk, how to do it intelligently where we're not putting ourselves in any major risk. We're just risking change and a little bit of discomfort for the greater good. Now, what happens when you do make that change? You've had all those successes and you keep moving forward and things become easier and easier and easier because you've intelligently spent that time developing the success that you want. And that's something that I had started to experience, like mentioning before how having the negative experiences shaped me in terms of being ready to hustle, being the underdog, being able to do whatever it takes to keep moving forward and keep having that growth. Well, there were certain parts of my life where I hit those goals and I would go into a bit of depression where having the success that I wanted at that time, it meant that I didn't have that vector, which I talk a lot about, having that direction. So I always say the first thing to do is to have a vector, have your origin point of where you are and have the target point of where you want to be because then you draw a straight line. Then you know where you need to go. But when you get to that point and you can cross 
that goal off the list, in some ways, you're going to feel like you're back at square one. You're going to feel like you're back at the beginning because you're lost. You don't have a vector anymore. And until you get that next vector, and that's why it's good to have those bigger, bigger plans that might feel unrealistic, but each time you cross off that major goal, you're one major step closer to the bigger goal. But for me, let's say 21, I wanted to be supervising uh, on feature films. I wanted to be working in LA. There's a lot of other key goals that I wanted to have. And when I achieved all that, that's where I had about two years or three years of being depressed because I didn't have a new goal. And on top of that, I had a lot of success, especially coming to LA where I expected to be you know, nobody um, in the industry coming to Hollywood and then coming over here and finding that there was such a, a much more connected industry here than Australia, which was still very divided at the time. So it actually meant that suddenly I had people everywhere I knew or they knew me and bit by bit, I was able to build a network very quickly and through that network, be able to do what I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do. And it was really great kind of having, again, more and more success when I got to Los Angeles. But the flip side was that without a direction, I didn't really have a way to measure my success moving forward. So there was definitely a period where I just had fun and I was earning a lot of money, but it meant that I could just be stupid with it and fly around and pick jobs that might not interest me, but the opportunity did. So taking jobs in New York or Europe or uh, going to talks all over the world, spending sometimes up to $10,000 a week in hotels, just literally blowing money, being really irresponsible, having fun, but at the same time, just not making any real progress in ways that I think I could value. And it took me a while to kind of figure out the next goal for me, which was going to be launching a studio. And again, going back to what I said earlier about when you have that accountability, when you have a trainer in the morning expecting you to show up, when you have a webinar where you have 50 or 100 people sitting in there waiting for you to, to show up, having that accountability, the expectations of others that you could easily let down, having responsibility, that's going to force you to act. And when I launched Catastrophic in Australia, and we grew very quickly to about 30 employees, I had then that responsibility again, and it helped me get back on that path. Because now it wasn't the security of myself, I had the responsibility of other people that I had to make sure that we had work coming in, because otherwise I would still have to pay everyone and I would need to compensate for that. And bit by bit, making sure that everyone else's goals are, are being met, like what they want, making sure that we're all moving in the same direction. So throughout life, the, the, the highs and lows that I've had have always been when I had a sense of purpose, when I had direction, when I had the accountability of others around me to know that I'm going to not want to disappoint them and therefore disappoint myself. And as I've mentioned that, you know, and I'm sure we all have these similar experiences. For me, it was making sure that I had goals and I had bigger goals beyond that. And I think in the last couple of years, I've definitely made massive changes to my lifestyle, my career, become a lot more responsible, but at the same time, um, put a lot more invested time into the things that I'm really passionate about. I talked about in 2005, making the year of no, and that was a massive impact for me because every year I have goals that I want to achieve and every year other things come up. You know, on a smaller scale, I could think of um, a dozen movies like The Matrix or Lord of the Rings or all these other projects that I ended up having to pass or skip because I had agreed to some other commitment literally just before that one. And this would be a common reoccurring thing. The minute I started to eliminate that and say, I'm going to only say yes to the opportunities that really excite me, that I really feel right about rather than saying yes for the sake of needing to work. That changed my life. And obviously, to get to that stage, it does require having those margins set up, knowing that, hey, for me, it meant that as long as I have X amount of money in the bank, I can still say no to certain projects comfortably. Whereas, you know, I'm not going to blindly to say no to everything until I'm broke. So again, any big changes I make, I've always made sure that I have the margins set in place. So that way I know I can comfortably pursue something and never go into that emergency situation that I experienced when I was 16, 17. And the same thing with you changing careers or anything else, same deal. You want to be able to position yourself with those margins in place to be able to measure when you're succeeding are those mini goals and when you're failing are those emergency buffer lines. 
those safety margins. So for me, 2005, I completely changed my lifestyle a lot by simply starting to only bring on the jobs that I was really excited about that I knew would make a massive impact on me and saying no to the bigger ones that um, might've been really great opportunities, but they weren't the right opportunity that aligned with my bigger goals. For once, I, I put my priorities ahead of everyone else's. And by saying no, it tripled my revenue. By saying no, it allowed me to focus on things that I've been wanting to do for years and I couldn't. By saying no, it allowed me to build my mentorship and put all of my time into that and really give back a lot more as well as just spend more time helping impact other people's lives and careers, putting out a lot more things, working on the podcast was um, the year that it all started. And, you know, all of these things all fell into place the minute I started checking, you know, whether these things aligned with my goals and having that one goal in mind at a time and being able to, to check that vector and say, hey, you know, uh, I mentioned Independence Day uh, was one of them, Eddie Murphy uh, wanting to do a, a three picture deal. Like there's a few other big projects at the time that were popping up. And for me, it was, it was, it surprised me how quickly I was able to react and say no, because all it came down to was, does this align with the vector that I have right now? And so throughout 2005, throughout 2006, I started to get a lot of success and a lot more growth. And I've kind of exponentially had that throughout my career. And it's been really hard work to get to that point. But this is exactly what I want to talk about is now that uh, over the last couple of years, I've had so much growth and a lot of things I would never have expected to ever be possible have all kind of come into fruition through that sheer ignorance and just determination and being out of my comfort zone 24 seven. It got to a point where now come 2006 last year, I started to go through a period where, as I mentioned earlier, I really felt like I wasn't getting any more growth. Now, I do think that part of it is just goal setting. I was doing those grandiose goals, but not measuring in between. But either way, I definitely felt like I was in limbo. And I remember having to explain this to, I can say Christina now, rather than saying girlfriend or fiance, but, um, you know, from episode 99. But uh, that was one of the things that I remember having to explain to her one morning. She came upstairs and saw me watching Rocky Three, And she's like, weren't you watching this last night? I'm like, yeah. I'd been watching it over and over and over because in a lot of ways, I felt like I could relate to Rocky and not in any ignorant way of like he was, you know, greatest fighter on the planet, but the fact that he had achieved a lot of success. And for me, I can at least say that I've, I feel that I've achieved a lot within the range that I measure. In other words, in my little bubble, I feel like I've managed to accomplish a lot of what I've set out to do. And I felt like I'd been at a point where I was on the the edge of risking going soft, not being as focused, as hungry, as determined as I should be. And for Rocky, especially Rocky Three, that was the situation where Rocky was on top of his game and he was the world heavyweight champion. He had Mickey throwing a lot of fights for him, basically setting him up with easy wins, easy opponents that he could uh, he could beat. And he just didn't have that hunger anymore. And I'm not sure if you can relate to this, but Maybe you do have that. Maybe you have friends around you that are telling you how great you are and telling you you're at the top of your game or that it's okay, you know, where you're at instead of being people who are pushing you to be better or better yet, they don't want you to change because it's going to be a reflection of themselves having not got into that level, having not achieved their goals. So they want to pull you down rather than pull you up. Now, at the same time, last year was a very successful year. It's just I couldn't see it at the time. And I still wanted more from it, but I'd be speaking at multiple events all around the world. I was um, speaking at business events as well, which was a very new experience for me um, in crowds of people who make a million, 10 million, $150 million a year, very much out of my league in terms of the financial growth that those people have had, but teaching them about branding, about marketing and a lot of other areas within an area that I'm more familiar with. I worked on dozens of high-end projects. We launched a live action series, which was uh, huge. Um, definitely the biggest thing that I've ever put together. And in a way that's forced me to grow. And it's definitely been the most overwhelming thing that I've ever had to do. And um, in some ways I'm still working on adding to that and, and working on a lot of the 
the later lessons and even this week um, doing some shoots for it. But it's definitely been something that as much as I had a lot of success, I couldn't really measure it and I couldn't really see it. And it made me feel like that I'm not moving forward, even in a lot of areas though that I was. Now, I flew to Austin in Texas at one point to attend a business conference. And I was there for about a week, got to see some friends and catch up with everyone. One of the talks that I attended was from a guy who has an online business. It's an online uh, software product. And he's talking about his journey from early on till where he is now and talking about a lot of his failures along the way and staying hungry the entire time. Everything that he said really resonated with me because it was exactly the same experiences that I had had. And I just felt really connected to this guy. And he talked later about how now that he has a successful business and he's making millions doing what he does, how he doesn't really have that hunger anymore. And he wishes that he still did. And it was one of these off comments he kind of just said under his breath. It was more to himself, but he said that maybe if he didn't have the millions of dollars, maybe if he didn't have all that financial stability, maybe if he was broke, that he would get that hunger back. And it was such an innocent comment that I, I doubt he even remember saying it. But to me, that's exactly what I'd been feeling. It's exactly what I'd been experiencing where I felt like I've had a lot of financial success, career success, all the areas that I typically measure to say, are you safe or make sure that you're, you're good in these areas, having all of that in excess meant that none of those things were a gun to my head anymore. None of those things were going to be a force for change. They, there was no fire. It was a fizzled out because all of those buckets were full. So I ended up having drinks with that speaker later that night and chatting to him just because it's something that really stuck with me because like I said, I'd already been feeling that and talking with him more about it. I was like, dude, like I, I feel like I'm in the exact same situation as you and I need to get that change. I need to make those changes to remove those pillars of comfort that I've kind of built up around me. And I didn't mention it to anyone at first. I went back to Los Angeles and I was very quiet about it, but I started to think, what if I were broke? What if I didn't have access to all of the studios, the clients, the movie work, all the things that are in LA that are a gold mine, a fountain, a resource for me, all of the positives, all the things that I've built up over time, what if they were all taken away? What if I were to start from scratch? What if I were to burn everything to the ground and from the ashes, rebuild everything up from scratch and do it better this time? What if I rose the stakes in other areas? What if I completely changed everything, my environment around me? So I thought about that and I thought, well, what if I get my money, I invest it all, so I have zero in the bank account, then that's going to cause some change. But I felt a better thing for me to do at that time would be, well, buying a house makes sense because that way I'm, I'm not flushing like $3,000, $4,000 in rent a month, which is what it costs to live in LA in Santa Monica. Um, it would allow me to do something smart with the money. It's not like I'm going to be like the Joker in Dark Knight and burn all my money up just for the sake of, of motivating myself again. So it was more about what if I built a plan to allow me to get rid of all my liquid finances and do it in an intelligent way. So it actually is doing something good, but put me back in that discomfort with money. And what if the other areas, and the more I thought about this, I thought about the positives and negatives around my environment. There's so many positives with friends, my network, opportunities, everything that people move to Los Angeles for. But at the same time, there's also negatives and they're not necessarily poisonous things, but they are negatives in terms of having a wide base of friends, having the same routines, the same rhythm, all those things that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, all of those things that people calling you up at 11 o'clock at night, people calling up at 10 in the morning saying, let's hang out, let's hang out, all the things that happen all the time. What if I took away all the, the things that were kind of setting a bar for me? literally starting from scratch, creating solitary, what would that be like? And this is where I started to build up a plan in my head, which sounds crazy, but it's, okay, I live in LA. I've got all this going for me. What if I move to another city where I don't know anyone, there's no movie industry, there's no opportunities in terms of what I would measure as opportunities at the time. And I created an environment for myself to be able to do the things that I want to do. This would become my sandpit where 
I would have an, an amazing environment I can shoot in, a dedicated space for me to work in. I would be able to eliminate all the distractions that commonly would come up, but at the same time, be able to schedule the d- distractions that I wanted. In other words, for me to be able to go to LA or go to Vancouver very easily to be able to work, have meetings, do all the things I want, but on my time. Exactly what I talk about when I say to, you know, eliminate distractions of going to lunch every day with all your buddies and all the things. If you want to make change, if you want to be productive, these are the things that you want to do. Schedule them, make it a Starbucks walk, whatever it might be, or make it a Friday lunch thing. All the people you got to see that week, start scheduling parties, doing all these things to allow you to create more time for yourself. This would be my way of being able to do all that on a bigger scale. So I started looking at Austin and I started looking at Portland. I'd never been to Portland. I've been to Austin once and that was that time. So I ended up flying to Portland for a weekend. Just went up there with a buddy of mine because I was going to go by myself and just checked it out to see if I'm crazy. I'd never been to this place before, but the idea of it raining, the idea of it being green, that was enough. That's all I knew about Portland, but it made sense to me. I flew up, I drank and I partied for two days straight and I flew back with my plan in place. And again, I had not told a soul. And that's when I decided to pitch this idea to my partner and the two of us fly out there and look for a house and literally with the intent of buying a house that week, which sounds insane, especially when you're looking at, um, you know, some of the houses that we're looking at were well over a million dollars. And to make a decision that week of we're going to buy a house, we're going to move up here, leave LA, leave everything. It's a huge way to flip everything, flip the script entirely, but with good intent. So we flew up and checked it out. You know, so while I'm looking at houses, I'm basically trying to convince Christina to give up what she'd been used to and move to Portland where we knew nobody. And within those four days that we were there, we picked a house, made an offer and bought the house and went through the process from there. So it sounds insane to literally be going through a lull and then decide I want to make change and then go and execute on that. But for me, that was the urgency I wanted. I wanted to come 2017 to be able to create that sand pit where I could go and create the changes, create the goals, create all the things that I wanted to do. And this is exactly what I talk about in the podcast is getting out of my comfort zone, eliminating all the bad habits and bad influences. And if this was the reverse, if someone was in Portland and they wanted to have a successful career, I would tell them to go to where the work is, get out of their comfort zone, move to LA, move to Vancouver, move to where there's a gold mine of work, a resource, and begin to network, begin to do all the things that I went out and had to do again myself. The thing is I did in reverse. I left the gold mine. I left that fountain. I seeked out solitary and began to network and create a new life there. Now, of course, just like anything, you don't take risks without having things in place. So for me, it was more about moving somewhere. The rule was I need to be 30 minutes to the airport or less specifically. So that way I can be in LA. I can be in Vancouver. I can drive to Vancouver from where I am. Um, I'm in the same time zone as LA. I'm in the same time zone as Vancouver, the two biggest movie capitals of the world. Nothing changed in terms of really time zone or anything else. It's a two hour flight from Portland to LA. And to me, I feel like with traffic in LA, it's pretty much two hours to get anywhere. So to me, that didn't really change things too much. And it meant that 30 minutes to the airport, I can be wherever I need to be. But at the same time, I get the benefit of going somewhere that has this new quality of lifestyle. I get fresh air, fresh trees. I'm near lakes, waterfalls, and everything else. It's amazing. But at the same time, I'm away from all the things that typically I would need to do. But at the same time, there's there's no industry here. And I'm sure that's going to change, but there's very few studios here. And as far as I understand, Leica, for instance, is kind of taking a break from doing any big visual effects right now. And there are a few studios up here doing other stuff. Shout out to Refuge. What's up? (laughs) Um, And Yeah, you know, but it's just not really at the same scale uh, as Los Angeles in terms of the amount of studios, the amount of things coming in and out all the time. So for me, I wanted to practice what I preach. In other words, doing everything I've said in the podcast, I want to do that at a larger scale. I wanted to confine myself into a new environment, literally have to build everything up from the ground up, which is scary to do, especially to do it so quickly. But I felt the urgency of needing to do it So I could then have the time to get that growth and do all the things I want outside of the comfort zone that I've created for myself. So investing all of my money into buying a house, 
um, and having to pay off a chunk of it still as well, it meant that for me to get back to LA, and this has been my philosophy, I need to earn my way back. So having been in LA and being so comfortable, it means that now I've in a way depleted all my resources enough that for me to go back to LA, I don't need to do a 30 year mortgage or whatever it might be. It would mean that I need to pay that off quicker. The sooner I pay off my house, the sooner I hit the goals, the the things I want to do. So that way, when I know that all these check boxes are met, then I can go back is how I can measure when it's time to go back. So in other words, the harder I work, the more growth I have, the quicker I can do that. The quicker I pay everything off, the quicker I make all the right moves, the quicker I can get back to where I want to be. So depleting your savings, all the things that I mentioned, those are the things that for me were really critical because it meant that now you've got a steep mortgage because you want to pay something off much quicker. It means that you're going to need to have very steep financial goals. Not having the resources of Activision, Riot, Digital Domain, all these other places in your backyard, literally walking distance from you means that you're going to need to be able to go and get new work to internationally be able to work on projects completely remotely. And that's what I've done. I've got a new environment, a new sandpit to be able to to do what I'm doing. And I love it because right now, as we speak, I've got a massive sauna and ice bath being set up in my backyard, which sounds ridiculous, but ice baths, cold therapy is something that I've talked a lot about. Getting that energy, getting that jolt in the morning has been really critical. Having a massive six bedroom house located right down the street from Nike's headquarters with a great view and being able to have dedicated rooms for all the things that are important means that I've got that dedicated space to do all the things that I want to do. A garage for film equipment and everything else. I'm now looking at getting a new office set up out here as well. I mentioned two episodes ago about 90 day goals and for me, I've had that time to get settled and and get through all the the talks and other things I've had coming up throughout the year. And now it's about doing all the things that I set out to do. So my critical goals for the rest of the year are things like health, working on finishing up some courses of mine, new courses I'm developing, expanding my team, rebuilding my website, which has been something that's been going on for years and now making that progress. All the little things, but also the bigger things, a few film projects and short film projects I'm tied to to do scheduling film shoots and doing more training, more free training, working on growing the podcast. There's a lot of different stuff. This is the catalyst to make all of that happen. And like I said, when the time comes, being able to go back to my home, going back to LA, which I consider my home after living there since I was 21. So forcing change, I think is really critical for all of us. And at the same time, like having experienced that comfort a little bit too much and success is a great thing, but you still want to stay hungry. And I like Mark Cuban, how in Shark Tank, he talks about that, how there's always going to be someone hungrier than you, working harder than you, right behind you. And if you lose a hunger, that person's going to beat you and and overtake you in that career rat race. I think it's critical no matter where you're at to still have further to go. And for me, it was definitely a mindset shift to take everything that I value, everything that I feel is making my life easy and eliminate all of that and have to start from scratch. So I don't know whether this episode will resonate with everyone, but I'm hoping that the examples of identifying why you might be seeing progress or why you think you might not be seeing progress when really you probably have progress in certain areas, but it's really just the way that you're measuring it or the fact that you're overwhelmed and don't even try in the the first place is because you're overwhelmed by the grandioseness, if that's a word, of um, of hitting those goals. So getting off the couch, showing up at the gym, doing the simple little tweaks to get that easy win can be that catalyst point to really achieve the bigger goals down the line. But also eliminating all these things when they are in excess, I think is a good idea no matter what we're talking about. And also just forcing yourself to have those massive changes because for me, I'm enjoying having to create new friendships. Um, It's funny, my my entire street is literally either Intel, Nike or Autodesk. So there's a lot of commonalities there between all these people, but at the same time, they are in different spaces to the typical people I know. They're in slightly different industries within those companies. And again, the more I get to, to build everything up and to do it the way that I want, the more I feel in control of, of what's going on. 
And even though I'm in Portland with no industry where I can actually go and work hands-on, it's 2017. And that's one key thing I've talked about a lot. I'm going to be doing some upcoming episodes on working remotely. But for me, I didn't bat an eyelid. I, I literally arrived here and I was like, what's the industry like? Oh, it's pretty small. Okay, not a big deal. And I continue to work on big projects without needing to go out and seek those, um, those local jobs. So even though I'm not in LA, I'm still getting plenty of work from LA. And I'm still getting plenty of studios saying, come down or we got projects. Can you handle it? Do you have the bandwidth? So I think no matter where you are, whether you're in a hotel in Thailand or wherever you want to be, you're able to work these days and get those clients, get those big projects and be able to use and facilitate all the tools necessary to be able to work and be able to accomplish what you're doing as if you were on site. And that's something that I want to talk more about in upcoming episodes. But I think for me, this is really critical. It's something that I definitely wanted to talk about because I feel that for me, I was very excited about this chance to start from scratch, to build up what I want. And now I'm kind of, like I said, that 90 days is where I have officially wanted to start kicking things in the gear and doing the things that I wanted to do and already seeing a lot of the the success and things growing, uh, moving closer to my bigger plans for January. It's inspiring to kind of see it all coming together. And I feel like we all have that opportunity to do it, but sometimes we're going to need to burn everything down to build it all back up. So for you building that plan, looking at the things that maybe are, you know, aren't uncomfortable, but maybe they're the opposite. They're too comfortable can sometimes be a very important thing to identify. So that way you can get that growth. And I want you to have that growth, especially leading up to the end of the year, I want you to start to look at ways that you can change, get out of your comfort zone, and then sometimes identifying all the the poison as well as sometimes the things in excess are the ways to to realize like where you need to make change. Having money is good. Having access to money all the time is sometimes not necessarily the, the greatest thing. So that's why, let's say, changing career, it's great. You can have that backup savings. That way you've got that safety margin there identify the other things that you need to have backed up so that way you're in a safe point that you can go out and take risks but eliminating them at that point so that way you need to as if you had a gun to your head is the real way to to force change and to make those results really stick because otherwise if it's optional rather than that sense of urgency then you're not necessarily going to stay consistent having that accountability having people expect that of you having the responsibilities all the things that you put on yourself to make sure that you don't fail, to make sure you don't back down. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I decided to do a 72 hour fast and I wanted to do this for fun. And for me, going through the harder parts of it uh, in the beginning were because I wanted to get to that state of day three where you have more of like a mental clarity. And for me, that was what I was excited about. And, and as difficult as it is the first two days, knowing that pushing through there and getting to the third day, everything from this point is easy. You know, you don't have the hunger. You do have that clear mind. Everything kind of falls into place at that point. But I got to go through that struggle to, to get there. And I know it sounds insane doing a three-day fast, but um, again, it's something that I actually did a week ago. I did a two-day fast and it wasn't for weight loss or anything like that. It was purely... I just kept that recording because my stomach just rumbled really loud. Um, it, it's purely for the mental clarity. And for me, that was what I was excited about was just, I think I, I dubbed it euphoric clarity uh, a few days ago, but uh, I really like that mindset switch that once you get over the hump, you kind of go into. And um, yeah, so I mentioned that just because again, like you've got to go through those hard yards. You've got to do the hard bit before the easy bits come. And I hope this is something that does resonate with you. And like I said, it's, me putting a lot of what I talk about in the podcast into action on a much, much larger scale to get much, much larger results. And I'm in, I'm loving life at the moment. I'm, I'm looking out uh, my window right now, which is like a 10 foot window, um, just looking at all the leaves. And I'm, I'm never, I've only once really ever lived somewhere which had seasonal change. And that was Vancouver, BC. Uh, I've lived in New York and other places, but never where I would go through all the four seasons. And just that alone is just so enjoyable to get to experience like changes. Uh, you know, you take it for granted, but LA is just constant sunshine. You look out the window and it's like, oh, it's it's 80 degrees today or 25 Celsius. It's another great day today. whoop de doo But when it rains, when you have thunderstorms, when you, you have a light winter, which isn't too insane, 
you know, all of that. It's such a small thing, but it's so exciting. Every time I go on the freeway, I'm just like, it's so green because it is. It's it's um, just so different. And for me, I'm excited about being able to go out and shoot in these environments, especially as it gets into winter, because suddenly there's going to be all this fog and mist and residue everywhere. And I'm excited to be able to shoot a lot of this stuff. Uh, I had a call with a client recently. They wanted me to DP a, um, a TV commercial and they kept insisting on they want to shoot it in Canada. And I was like, why do you want to shoot in Canada? It's like, well, the, they have the right, the exact forests that we want. And for me, it's like, well, have you Googled Portland? Like it's the exact same forest as BC. So for me, um, thinking about all this stuff and planning it all out, it, you know, like I said, at this point, if I want all the comforts that I had, I've got to work and earn them all back. I've got to pay off a house that's usually a 30 year mortgage in a year or two if that was something that I want to get off of my plate. All the other goals, I need to go check, 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 get them all out. So that way I have that fire under my butt to get that change back. And so having those timelines, all that stuff. So I don't know if this is something that does resonate with you. If it is, I hope it is. Shoot me an email. I'd love to hear your thoughts on ways that you are able to identify those comfort areas that are a little too comfortable, as well as look at the areas that you might need to be uncomfortable in for a little bit to get that massive change, to get those wins. Okay. So again, just something that I really want to reiterate to you is to get out of your comfort zone, to remove all the things that might be holding you back, to remove the bad habits, to allow you to form new habits. And by taking yourself out of the equation temporarily, it's where you're able to think more clearly, reset and rebuild. So as much as you want that fire under your butt, you know, that fire of change, you might also need that fire of change to be something that allows you to burn everything that you know down to the ground and rebuild it up, rebuild it better, stronger, and let that be the catalyst for success. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I know it's been a bit of a long one and I appreciate you sticking around through till the end. What do you think? Leave a comment in the show notes or shoot me an email. Uh, just go to alanmckay.com slash 103 for episode 103. And like I said, it would mean the world to me if you can go to the show notes and just share this episode. So click the share button and then leave a review on iTunes, which just means click the review button. And like I said, one or two words, great, bad, terrible, hated it, loved it, whatever. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get feedback as well. I'm always open to that. And um, yeah, like I said, it would mean the world to me if you can share it just because again, I want as many people to benefit from this as possible. And you can be that guy or girl who gets to help spread the word. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you. And I'll be back next episode with Victor Navone from Pixar. Rock on.